Thanks for jumping into another podcast episode brought to you by Bad Tabletop Gaming. Your hosts are Bill, Armin, Andy, and Dan. If you are a new listener, welcome and thank you for your support. If you're a returning listener, welcome back and thank you for your support. Before we kick this new episode, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Tony at Hammerhead Games, who has a variety of MDF and plastic cut gaming essentials from army trays to objectives and much, much more. And Matt at Pop Goes the Monkey, who has a large inventory of top-notch upgrade bits and specialized add-ons for the models in your collection. Links for both pages can be found in the descriptions of our videos. Lastly, if you like what we are doing, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit us up in the comments, as we love all the feedback you give us to help us improve the channel and podcast. And we're back. Back with part two of the Blood Angels. Uh, Armin here is with me. Hey, guys. And we also have James again. So Hello. We'll, we'll be tearing up the rest of this book and finishing off the Blood Angels. So, where did we leave off? I think it was... We, we just wrapped up the Angel's Tears. That's right. That's right, right, that's right. So we kind of... Uh... Went through all the fluffy stuff, I guess, and then we started going through the units, and we finished out with Angel's Tear, so now we're at the Dreadnought. Yeah. The so if you haven't Hatter. watched part one, just hit up our uh, YouTube channel, and you'll see it. It's right before this one, so I think it's uh, episode 16, I think it is. Um, but yeah, I can always link it there as well. So. Yeah. But yeah, Contemptor and Candius class Dreadnought. So is this guy in any of the fluff? Um, not, not that I can recall, um, definitely not in any of the old fluff, uh, they, they may have added it in fluff in book, uh, since this book, but, uh, it definitely wasn't a pre-existing thing. Okay, okay, so how good is he? Uh, well, you know, I think, uh, he, he is a very thematic unit, right? So, when you look at him, you know, he's a, he's a... Contemptor, Dreadnought, so weapon skill, but skill 5, strength 7, uh, front 13, 12 side, 10 rear, initiative 4. So, uh, you know, stock Dreadnought, um, he costs 20 points more, but when you look at what you get, so he comes with Armored Ceramite, which is nice because uh, most Dreadnoughts do not have access to that, and, you know, when vehicles do, it's a 20 point upgrade. So, um, right off the bat, the, uh, you know, you're looking at his point cost, he's more economical than a regular Contemptor. So 20 points more gets you the, um, the, uh, oh, what's it called? The, uh, what am I thinking of? Ar armored Ceramite? Yeah, the Armored Ceramite generally, right? So that's yep. good there. Um, and uh, he comes with his jetpack, obviously, which is built into the cost. So... Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I think I think it's a really cool looking dreadnought. Um, you know, he's got two talons of perdition, so they are base strength AP two melee and death fire. Death fire is the uh, the rule that the blades Regular of perdition have. Right. Uh, right. So very similar to you know kind of their just basically double up the wounds. Now I think the inspiration from this comes from the Death Company dreadnought claws that were released back in uh, fifth edition. Okay. Um, for 40k, like it, it definitely is like a blender. Um, the thing with the booster pack is you can use it once per game in one of two ways. You either deep strike him um, or you can shock assault him, which basically um, you get to move him uh, as a jump you know, infantry in the movement phase, um, or you can assault with 3d6 in the... Uh, you know, charge range, you know, ignoring models and, and then whatnot. So very similar to basically just a one-use jump pack. Um, you know, when you look at his upgrades, he has access to the Melted Gun for five points cheaper than a normal Contemptor Dreadnought, and he comes with, you know, you can also give him the Assault Cannons for 15, um, and you can also give him the regular Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon for free on one fist. Um, and then, of course, extra armor for 10. Never would do both, right? No, I honestly I think um, you know you'd you'd almost always take 
uh, just one Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon. Um, and specialist one Talon. Weapon? Sorry, what? Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon? Is it a Specialist Weapon? Uh, I, I don't... don't I don't... So. No, it's not. It's not. Nope. The Talon of Perdition isn't. Just and, uh, uh, Melee Deathfire. So. Yeah. So, there's I'm really no... The weapon. Uh, I, I don't think it's a Specialist Weapon, no. I don't think so. I'm kind of trying to find it and look, but... Uh... I don't ever remember thinking that it was. No, I um, I, I we'll have to check on that. But uh, if if it is, I could see why you might not want to take just one, um, because you'd you'd lose out the attacks. But um, otherwise, you know, I'd always take one talon and one fist. You know, you've got the fist for vehicles, and uh, you know, instant deathing tough guys, and you've got the talons for blending stuff. Um, you know, I just I just painted one up today, and they're super awesome, gorgeous model. Um, and it also, you know, with the deep strike, um, it saves you a hundred points on you know a dreadnought drop pod. Right. The only yes. downside is that you still scatter and you could potentially miss half. But, totally. Uh, I mean, as long as you play smart, if you put two melee guns on there, like you can still you know threaten a lot of things and. Yeah, deep striking, it's it's pretty nice. I mean, for what, you'd give them two, let's say, melt guns? So yeah, that's two, that's what I would do, yeah. Points, right? So, I mean, that's kind of nice. You know, you deep strike for free. Well, not for free, but technically almost for free. Yeah, that, right? yeah. So that, that's, that's kind of nice. And he takes a fast attack slot, eh? Yeah, which is nice, right? Because elite slots are pretty uh, pretty high competition. Um, as are heavy heavy support slots. So you know, a lot of the times it's you know the fast slot that you know you're not you, you know unless you're playing like white scars or you know an army that's like focusing on aircraft or you know light vehicles. Um, you know, because even if you're running like if you're running like a bikes or jet bikes, you're generally going to take a right that unlocks them as troops. So you're not going to even necessarily be using the all the flat, fast slots. So it's nice that uh, this guy isn't competing. Um, I know that the, the kind of cool thing is, is this guy allows you to take him in the, uh, what's it called? The, um, day of revelations, mm -hmm. um, right of war because he's got deep strike. Right. So, um, and you know, like we mentioned, not having to pay a hundred points for a dreadnought drop pod. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. For a good unit. Yeah, and the model's cool, right? Um, I know that, like, I, I love the fist. I love the talon. Um, <laughs> I, I, I actually converted mine, so I just did a body swap with the regular Blood Angels Contemptor because I love the very ornate um, chassis on the regular Blood Angels Contemptor, but I gave him the, the jetpack and the, uh, the snippy claws from this dude for sure because nice. it's, it's iconic. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see that. So I can't actually randomly find rules for a Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon anywhere. All I can find is a Dreadnought Chain Fist. That said, I still think it's not a specialist. Because you always used to combine a Chain Fist with a Close Combat Weapon. So I just can't seem to find it. But that's okay. I'm pretty sure it's not a specialist because we always combine the Chain Fist I, with I, a regular weapon and you always get the attack. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it is. No, no. So you would always want to, like, game, game terms, you'd always want to replace one. Um, yeah. Uh, the the model comes with two of the, the blades, right? It does, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, and... honestly, for why oh, like, go you're going just for really cool look, and if you're not really playing him to like, you know, game and to, you know, if you want him for fluff, I mean, the two talons are still really good, and you know, they look great. Yeah, and that's what I'm, you know, honestly, like uh, when I built mine. Um... You know, my Blood Angels are, are kind of more of a of a of a passion fluff project for me. I'm not I'm not necessarily gonna min max them. So, you know, having this guy in there with two talons, um, it's not you know, it's it's not a bad choice, it's just you know, versatility is always good, right? That's I think one thing that we always talk about is, you know, if you if you have more versatility it's it's a plus. So you know, and being able to, to swap it out for free is is nice so overall beautiful model very iconic um but definitely um a relatively new thing in terms of the canon and the fluff nice all right i th i think i think we're on to characters now yep that is correct we're, 
Yeah, Mr. Aster Crone. Um, so he is uh, again um, a new a new character, uh, one that we hadn't really seen before in the Heresy. Um, he is basically uh, a souped up Mortat. So when we look at him, he's got weapon skill five, weapon skill five, strength toughness four, three wounds, initiative five, three attacks, leadership ten, and a two up save. He's uh, 155 points, so you know not not an expensive character, but definitely not a overly cheap one either. Um, he comes stock with artificer armor, two hand flamers, the Safen shard axe, um, which is plus one strength, AP three, and rending, uh, a refractor field, frag crack, and rad grenades. Um, so you know, pretty. Pretty decent gear. Um, I, I'm never really a fan of characters that have anything less than, than AP2. Um, but again, when you look at this guy with the two hand flamers, he's definitely someone that you're going to want to probably have, you know, targeting a horde or, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of weak units just pumping out the wounds, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, and and rending doesn't hurt, right? So if you're if you're caught in you know a bad situation, the nice thing is is it's not a specialist weapon, so you do get the extra attack with it and whatnot, and the striking you initiative. So it's it's not like it's horrible. Um, I'm just I'm just a partial I'm just partial for AP two. Um, he's got uh, obviously Legion of Stardust Blood Angels. He's an independent character, adamantium will, um, which is kind of just a uh, you know. Not not a rule that we see a lot of, but uh, you know it's always nice if you're playing against Thousand Suns or Demons and you look at your guy and you're like, oh, he's got you know Adamantium Will. Um, he's got Scout Counterattack and two special rules. So the first one, the Ghost of Safe, is the first time he's reduced to zero wounds or removed from play. On a D6 of a four up, he's placed into ongoing reserves with a single wound remaining instead of being removed or destroyed. If he enters ongoing reserves on or after turn four, then he may enter play automatically at the start of the controlling player's turn. So that's kind of cool. I think um, it reminds me of, uh, remember like old school Saint Celestine? Um, she kind of had a rule like that, right? When, you know, you, you killed her the first time, she'd pop back or... Uh, there Commissar Yurik another... Yurik had the same thing. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I always kind of liked those, you know, kind of gimmicky... <laughs> to me, that's like a uh, that's a gimmick that's actually pretty impactful, right? Because it's like, oh, you know, uh, y you think you de dealt with something, and then it pops up, and you know, you run around or contest an objective, or you know, just does more damage, right? It's uh, he kind of reminds me of Captain Tycho. Yeah, he definitely. You know what? <laughs> it's funny to say that because yeah, Captain Tycho has the like the you know phantom of the opera thing going on with his yeah. blood angel mask and this guy kind of has a similar type thing where like the bottom part of his face is is covered it reminds me of um you know back in world war one when uh you know soldiers would get you know their you know their jaws shot or something they used to sculpt um those kind of wooden oh yeah those wooden uh like bottoms of faces I, I'm, I'm sure now they've got much more advanced you know <laughs> prosthetics but that's what it reminds me of um and uh i'm actually looking forward to this guy's model if the art is anything to indicate because I, I think it's kind of uh, a, a cool you know a, a cool unique look um now his second unique rule virtue of judgment now this is one that has got people when the book came out barking and and rule lawyering um but basically it, it says at the start of the game, after deployment, but before the first turn is declared, roll a d3. Uh, Crone's controlling player may select a number of enemy units equal to the number rolled to be marked by the Angel's Wrath. Whenever Crone or a Destroyer's or Angel's ter Tears unit is used to make a shooting attack against a unit marked with the Angel's Wrath, his hand flamer attacks are made with Shred and Rending special rule. So, you know... So you can tell it's poorly written. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I think a lot of people, you know, kind of got confused by it. And, I, and 
you know, there's definitely even now still not consensus on it. Uh, Armin, how, how, how do you, you know, when you read that, w what's your first interpretation of it? Well, first thing is that it's written wrong. Like, it doesn't <laughs> actually make sense yeah. as a sentence. Um, yeah. Because, like, I don't know. Like, if you talk about destroyers, when a destroyer shoots at a unit, then his hand flamers get that unit, whether or not he's shooting at another unit. Like, that's technically how you should be interpreting it, but that makes zero sense yeah. at all, right? So I'm assuming what they meant to say is that whenever him, destroyers, or angel tier units uh, make a shooting attack with hand flamers, they gain the shred and running special rule. But can angel tiers even get hand flamers? Um, so y yes, because any unit that has a Volkite Serpenta for Blood mm. Angels okay. can swap okay. it out for a Hand Flamer at uh, 15 points. Right. So that's uh, what I think tension of the rule is. Yes. Is that the Hand Flamer would get Shred and Rending. Because I don't think, like somebody else might argue that any shooting of their attacks would get that rule, but that kind of doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right? I, I don't see that as an yeah. intention. And yeah, I think it's worded wrong. So I yeah. think the intention of the rule is that the Destroyer's Him or Angel's Tears hand flamer attacks are made with Shred and Rending. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, what, what, do you know what the consensus out there is? Is that basically the consensus with everybody? Or do you, are some people like really sticklers on this and saying, no, only he gets it? There, because that doesn't actually make sense. No, there, there, there definitely is sticklers that are saying, basically, and... and yeah, there are sticklers saying that rules is written, because it is rules is written, that only his hand flamers would get shred and rending. That being said, I think most reasonable people, it's pretty clear, This it's not a leap of logic to, to see what the intent was here, um, mm -hmm. because if it was just his weapon, um, you know, then they wouldn't even list destroyers or angels tears. Um, the other right. thing too, I, 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 like, oh, like the other, way I would read it, like you said, is like the only argument that I could make then is whenever these units make a shooting attack against a unit that's armed with angel steers, then his heavy, his hand flamer attacks are shred and rending irrelevant of whether he's targeting a unit with angel's wrath or not. Yeah. Right? And, and that's actually, that, that actually is, yeah, sorry. So that. That is how it's actually written, right? If you were going to go all, you know... Um... But but that really doesn't... Yeah, but that really doesn't make sense, no. right? Like, you get, like, his special tool. He gets to, like, put Angel's Wrath, like, Curse, or whatever you want to call it, target... Well, it's the virtue of judgment, yeah, right? Have... Like... Yeah, exactly, right. So, I, like, personally, I think that with everybody here and, you know, in our community, I would say if anybody wanted to play it like that, it'd be pretty shitty. And I think if there's ever a tournament ran or anything like that, I feel like the consensus would be that this is clearly an improper sentence. Yeah. And it doesn't actually make sense and, at all. Like, I know we've had, like, disagreements of all of our other rules, but this one, like, clearly doesn't make any sense. Because if the intention was the other way, they wouldn't include these units. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Sure. And, and I think, you know, for, for those listening, right, if, if you're planning on running, the, the best way to avoid conflicts when you're going to turn them into or you're in a league is to bring it up, you know, to the event organizer beforehand. You know, I know um, whenever we run events here, um, you know, I know when uh, Bill was running LVO, right? Like um, there's, there's definitely a group of rules or characters or, you know, rights of war that at any given time there's some contention about. So just go to the organizer and, you know, make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, this this isn't a. I don't think this in particular is going to be a hugely seen thing, uh, primarily because in order to upgrade your angels' tiers um, with two hand flamers, you're literally looking at a 45 point model. <laughs> so I don't think you're going to see a lot of angels' tiers with hand flamers. Is is it actually more points? I thought it was just a straight up swap. No, no, it's, uh, so, yeah, if you have a Volkite, you may, um, pay 15 points, uh, da, da, da. any model with, oh, no, you know, 
Uh, well, no, it says any model with Legion of Starhaze Blood Angels with a vo that has access to a Volkite Serpenta as part of their war gear may instead take a Hand Flamer for 15 points. Because Angel Seers don't technically have that as an option. They just no, come. they come stock. Huh. So maybe maybe it's only... Well, then, why would they... Again, poorly written mentioned. rules, right? I think so. I, I think... I'm just trying to look at their rules, the Angel's Tears. Like, well, they have two say Volkite Serpentas. Yeah, but yeah, so, so it says we can change their Volkite Serpenta with one of the following: he heavy flamer. Um, so maybe the intention was for all flamers to have that ability. So like it would make sense if you took your angels' tears, gave them heavy flamers, and you could yeah. still shred and rending. Or, um, or I, I, I honestly, what I think the intention probably was with hand flamers is if you have access to Volkite, you may get the uh, hand flamers for 15 points, or you may exchange them, or something along those lines, right? Volkites are usually a little cheaper, so maybe... Well, but these are Volkites yeah. or Penta. The Pentas are cheaper than the yeah. other kind of Volkites, so maybe that was the intention. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it's kind of weird all around. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think we'll see, hopefully, clarifications, you know, to come. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's Chrome. He's a, he's a Mortat, basically. Um, personally, you know, I think he's really cool. I think it'll be interesting to see, and whether I take him or not will determine on how awesome the model is. Um, as far as Mortats go, though, with Blood Angels having access to the double Melta, or the double Infernus pistols, that's definitely my kind of go-to until, uh, you know, until they give this guy a model, at least. Nice. Okay. Ralderon. I yeah. Want to Chapter Ralderon. Master Ralderon. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do, do up some Ralderon. Okay. So, I, like, if you guys listen to part one, and you should, like, Ralderon comes up in a lot of the horse heresies, right? And um, he's pretty awesome, right? Yeah. So, I, yeah. Anyways, you got to check him out. Uh, 180 <laughs> points, weapon skill 7. So, that's quite high. I think there's only a couple yeah only only sigismund right. abaddon and karn uh you know only the top tier and sevatar like only like the top top tier of space marines are weapon skill seven okay okay strength four toughness four three wounds five initiative four attacks ten leadership two plus armor so that the rest is kind of standard um so he's got artificer armor the warblade the incarmine warblade which we'll go over in a second uh so he comes with a combine flamer Okay, Bolt Pistol, Iron Halo, and of course Fragrant Cracker. Uh, his special rules, like the whole like page is a little empty, I feel. So his special rules, he's an independent character, Master of Legion, Furious Charge, and then he's got the Arcane of Wisdom, or Arcane of Wisdom, it depends how you pronounce it. Um, so that ability is he gets to pick his Warlord trait from the Legion of Stardis army list. Um, Warlord traits table. So I guess this is good when he's your warlord, because picking is pretty awesome, right? Um, but if you're running him with, let's say, um, Sanguinous. With Sanguinous, right? You're not you're not gonna get that. Um, I'm a, well, let's go over to Warblade. So the Warblade is plus one strength, so it would be five strength, two AP, uh, melee, mastercrafted shred, and murderous strike. So it's basically a master crafted shred paragon blade. I guess yes, as I say that's that. a, yeah, that's exactly um, yeah. what it is. Yeah, uh, shred is amazing. I love shred. Like shred is such a good rule. Uh, plus one strength is great. Uh, master crafted, of course, helps quite a bit. Um, and then it's not specialist weapon, right? So you can combine it with your bolt pistol, so he would get the extra attack, right? So he's now five attacks in close combat with furious yeah. charge. So with furious charge, giving him plus one strength on a charge, definitely big deal that yeah. said to be honest i'm a little underwhelming <laughs> well, oh no like he's good right i mean if you put him up against most other characters like he might be karn um I'm trying to it, so he'll 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 beat so he'll yeah he'll he'll beat karn if karn isn't armed with uh, gore father or gore child, gore child. Yeah. um yeah. Sigismund will wreck him 
Um, but Sigmund will wreck most of them because... Yeah, Sigmund will wreck all of them. That's, that's really right. Yeah, it's, um, it's that one rule that, that makes he'll, it. He'll, he'll, he'll... Looks... Oh, go ahead. Uh, I said, I, I meant, uh, Abaddon will beat Raldron. Yeah, well, just because um, he's got that instant death fist. Exactly, right, right. That's that's really the only reason. Yeah. Um, he'll yeah. beat Sabatar. He like he's so, you know, he he's not bad, right? He 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 isn't bad by any stretch. I I, I like like you said, he's he's good. He'll beat, you know, he'll beat Praetor's weapon skill seven is huge. Furious charge is huge. Being so being strength six with the Blood Angel, right, is a big deal. Um, because he's going to be wounding pretty much everything on twos, and even, you know, toughness seven things, he'll be wounding on fours um, on on the charge. On the charge, he's also got, uh, depending on your right of war, he'll be initiative six. Um, so, like, he, he's no slouch, but I, I, I think when you... When I envisioned him, I was envisioning a very Sigmund-esque type character like the way that they describe him in the fluff is in the same league as Sigismund um, and I think he definitely falls a, a wee bit short of that I'm just looking at his page right now and I'm like there's this big open space right I'm like and where's the rest of the, like, like where's the special rules where's the like, I feel like they had an opportunity to like give him rule right like yeah special because he's with Sanguinus all the time and I don't well, know they just had like so stuff to do for him and it's it's like nothing he he, he um, warlord trade. give him a warlord trade why make him think like give him well, a cool one I, I think the other thing too okay so when I first read the arcane of wisdom I thought it was way better than it was because I thought it was he could pick his warlord trait. So I was thinking, okay, he's gonna have he has access to all the ones in the book, which no, would be huge. Yeah, yeah, because like you know, you look at like a, a custodes um, tribune, like the ability to pick your warlord trait is is gargantuan, especially you know when there's warlord traits in the core book that let you infiltrate D3 plus one units type or D3 units, and there, there's some very significant um, ones. The, the Space Marine ones, you know, they're they're not my favorite, but there's there's some decent ones. I think um, I think he's good bang for your buck. I think for 180 points. Um, you know, when you combine his rules, his war gear with the Blood Angel ones, he's he's definitely a point efficient um, character. And I'd probably, you know, um, if it was, you know, pre Divining Blade, or if it was um, an event that didn't allow the Divining Blade, I'd probably definitely take him over a decked up Praetor. Um, so that's that's always a plus, right? Because yeah, you don't sure. want your you don't want you don't want your first your your chapter master and first captain to be less, you know, impactful than a Praetor. Uh, so I, I think that's good. I think when you talk about the model, that's where I was a little bit underwhelmed too. So don't get me wrong, I, I, I painted the model. It's a much better model than it looks on the web store because it, you know, Forge World, they're really hit and miss with their paint jobs. <laughs> And that one, I would say, was a, was a miss. It, it very much reminded me of like the the early 1990s, um, like the, the the bright red and um, armor. It just it just didn't really jive with the way that they painted the rest of the Blood Angels for 30k. It's like a, it's like a corn berserker almost. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know the the one thing um, I, I like, I honestly I I way prefer the Blood Angels Praetor model. Um, and it's funny because in in the uh, the book that we were talking about in part one, and by the way, Armin, I, I looked it up. It's the Painted Count. Painted um, Count. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, <my> God. <laughs> we were close. Painted Jester, Painted Prince, but uh, <laughs> there's a there's a piece of artwork of Ralderon in that duel, and he's got a helmet on, and it's it's literally it's it's the Forge World model of him with the Forge World Blood Angel Praetor helmet. So I actually converted my Ral, or kit bashed, I guess, my Ralderon to have that helmet, and it, it makes the model look significantly more cool. Um, so, overall... A, I'm, just, oh. I'm just a little disappointed with the lack of 
rules and lack of fluff, like lack of flavor that they put in this model, well, right? Especially when he's right next to a guy they made up, Aster Crone, that has, you right? know, a wall of text and a picture. <laughs> it's literally almost like somebody was tasked with doing this, and the day before they needed to come out, the book needed needed to come out, they forgot that they didn't do their job, and threw something together in two minutes, and was like, okay, that's good enough, right? Yeah. Like, so, so if you, like, you want my opinion on that, the wrong, like, um, you just, like, the model looks like a glorified sergeant. I, I totally, right? Like, you know, uh, and, but which part of it, you know, part of it is backed up by the fluff where Ralderon yeah. was a particularly austere and Spartan blood angel. Like, he, you know, he was still the chapter master of the blood angels, but he still wore the first suit of armor that he embarked on in the crusade, which mm. is an older mark of armor. Like, he definitely, you know... They definitely kept true to it in the fact that, like, he doesn't have a billowing cape and he doesn't have all this ridiculous work because the guy's a soldier. Um, <laughs> He's not an ultramarine. <laughs> no, right, right, yeah, and and it, it it makes him stand out amongst a legion that is very regal, right? It's um, you know, so I I don't mind too much because you know if 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 he was over the top then i'd be complaining that oh they 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 strayed away from the fluff right or you know heaven forbid they go too over the top like they did with valdor and you know he's got random cyber critters coming out of his right. you know yin yang and demon heads and you know I, I i did think the demon arm with the blood was a little bit you know i, I don't know it just it looks kind of cartoony um there, but you know, hey, I still bought the model. <laughs> the, the, some of the later models, you can tell there's a little bit of a change, right? Like even uh, what's his name, Tarvitz, Saul, Tarvitz there for the Emperor's children when they released him. There's kind of a little different look to them compared to the older. Is he out yet? Did, did they come or did they just leak him? Um, I thought he was out. I, I, see, I liked. I, 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 don't, I don't think he's out yet. I, I think they just previewed him. Um, but see, I kind of liked. Like, I kind of liked that look. Um, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Like, overall, I think Ralderon is a good enough rules that you can't really, you know, you can't complain that they're bad rules. And the model is decent or accurate enough that it's not, you know, it's not cry cry worthy but yeah. he I, I definitely wouldn't say either we're going to take home any awards for you know awesome rules or awesome model i do i yeah. do like the you know there's the simplicity in the model which is you know mm -hmm. could be good but i do like how they gave him like like his sword looks really really great like yeah and just that whole he's wiping the blood off of his sword keeping it pristine yeah. you know what i mean so, the, but the, he's the, like the master duelist, though. Like he's better. Like he's six men level. Uh, like the rules uh, they, don't like that. Like he's yeah, six they, men, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like Karn's rules don't reflect the fact that he's no, also I, technically uh, level. No, I think I that. think I think Karn's rules reflect it perfectly because I think Karn, Karn wasn't necessarily a duelist. He was a scrapper. Right. You're right. You're uh, right. You're right. And um, and like Karn will Karn will mow through an entire squad with his nine attacks with rampage. <laughs> I, I I think, um yeah. I, but I get what you're saying. Like Ralderon, like don't me wrong. Sig Sigismund is a league to in his own. Like all the fluff says that Sigismund was the greatest. Um, so I I didn't expect him. You know, and that's why Sigismund is the only Space Marine. Um, that has, you know, the Eternal Warrior other than, you know, uh, the Primarchs, right? Um, but I, I definitely expected a little bit more from him, from Ralderon, I mean. Yeah, right? I don't know. I, don't know. I was just a little disappointed by the rules, that's all. Like, I'm, I'm not saying make him better, but make him more unique. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. I guess, I guess that's the other problem, right? And, and, and I think, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about this you know in our within our community and within you know the the meta here that eventually you know the challenge with the heresy and the challenge i think 
from the beginning was how do you make the same army fundamentally unique you know and and i think it's a real challenge when you're on like the last two legions that get done or the last three legions that get done you know you're you've already got 30 plus epic heroes you've already got all of the like how do you how do you make someone unique how do you make them stand out right in the beginning in the first books it was easy because there was only a few legions out and only a few characters out but you know but it, it becomes a challenge i think you either start copying and pasting or you start getting really wacky and weird you know rules so i i don't i don't know what the solution is um but That's i definitely fair. don't think it's leave the page blank like they did with him <laughs> <laughs> no. No. It's it's just it's nice to to have the uh, the Blood Angel models out the way they did, right? Because really they only missed like what one Crone. character. Yeah, they only so. missed Crone. All right, we're here to do the big the big boy, the the thing that I'm sure most people are waiting for. <laughs> um, Sanguinius, the uh, the great angel, the brightest one, master of the hosts, primarch of the Blood Angels. Um, Master so, of hosts, what does that even mean? So the Blood Angels Legion was divided in hosts, like the, the hosts of heaven type thing. Um, so that's why, you know, if, uh, again, some of these titles, right? Some of these titles for the Primarchs are pre-existing. Some of them, they just make up on the spot, I'm pretty sure. Um, and that that is, I think, the one that they made up <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> So, um, Sanguinius, I think before I was like kind of pref preface it, right? He's a very unique Primarch. Um, I think there is so many different ways they could have went about Sanguinius, and I think that they kind of kept, they kind of stayed to the middle of the road with him, uh, and didn't do anything too crazy. So, um, I'm a huge fan of him, and uh, we'll go into kind of what it what his stats are, his war gear, and kind of strengths and weaknesses, and what I think, you know, if it was me, what I would have changed, and of course, hearing what you guys would have changed as well. But right off the bat, weapon skill nine. So tied with Angron and Russ um, as the only one of three Primarchs at weapon skill nine, um, and I think one of only five models. I think only Kabanda and Samus. Um, our weapon skill nine outside of the other two primarchs um ballistic skill five so pretty standard for a primarch right hitting on twos strength toughness wounds all six so average initiative seven so he is a higher initiative um than most um i think only fulgrim's eight right i think only fulgrim I think so, yeah. and Kerr, i think Kurz is eight too um so you know well, Kurt is eight as well yeah so Kurz and fulgrim yeah, are the I only think. two that are are faster initiative wise six attacks which is above average um he is uh i think Kurz also has six attacks when you factor in his two weapons angron has six attacks um so above average uh leadership 10 and two up save um so one of the first things, like Korax and Kurs, he is jump infantry. So that's 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 particularly significant, um, not only because it increases you know movement and, and charge and and hammer of wrath and whatnot, but it also precludes him from transports, um, which you know is is less of an impact given his special rules and the way that you play him than I think Kurz or Korax but that's still Agreed. that's still a significant disadvantage having a Primarch that cannot embark in a vehicle um, is, is it's always going to be a disadvantage um, and I think you know if there's one thing I would like to see it's um, you know Storm Eagles getting ret ret basically retconned to allow um, jump units to to enter them, kind of like the old Storm Ravens were in, in 5th ed edition 40k. Uh, what do you guys think about the fact that he's jump? I, I, I mean, he is, right? So I, I, I think in, in 
the way the fluff runs too is he's not like he's often by himself, right? He often runs by himself. He's often flying across the battlefield. But when we say like jump, I was almost disappointed to see that he's not flying. A flying, yeah, like a flying like, monstrous like, creature, like yeah. yeah. Well, I wouldn't say monstrous creature or, per se, yeah, but flying, no, but similar, yeah. Exactly, because like any fluff that you ever read, he literally like flies. Like he killed like a warlord titan or something by yeah, flying. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he he blasted a hole in its in its head and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I was kind of, don't get me wrong. Like I get rules wise, you don't want him just to have random fly and, and things like that. Um, I mean, fluff wise, I I don't think for him. I wasn't disappointed to see that he could enter a transport, for example. I don't disagree. No, no. I think some of the yeah. bigger transport should be able to carry uh, jump infantry, like Storm Eagles, maybe. Right? Yeah, a smaller amount, sure. But I, I don't see a reason why they couldn't. Um, kind of through the stories, like they even like sometimes put these massive like castleacks in there. Right? Oh yeah. In, in the yeah. Stories. So, <laughs> there's no reason, reason I think that you couldn't do but, it. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Andy. I was gonna say, well, like you know. Fluff-wise, like, how does he get transported around? Well, th that's the you know thing. I mean? they, they are in Storm Eagles. They are in Thunderhawks and Stormbirds. Um, Thunderhawks and Stormbirds allow you to transport jump, but I, I don't think anyone's surprised. I, I think everyone was expecting him to be no. jump infantry. Yeah. It's it's just it's an important thing to note for game terms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because again, only three of the Primarchs can't go in vehicles. Um, so. When we look at his uh, his special rules, he's got Primarch, obviously, which is the list of rules. Um, Angelic Presence, Sky Strike, very bulky, Sire of the Blood Angels. So we'll kind of go into go into those. So Sire of the Blood Angels, he gains plus one initiative and plus one attack in the first turn of any combat. And while he's present on the battlefield, all jump infantry units with Legion of Sartre's Blood Angel may choose to use their jump packs in both movement and assault phase and the Dawnbreaker squads may be chosen as troops. So this is a very impactful rule. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, I think one of the best Sire rules um, and potentially the best Sire rule if you're playing an army specifically, you know, around jump and, and, and whatnot. So the plus one initiative and plus one attack on the first turn of any combat um is quite significant um because yep. you think about it when you're charging now you're charging with eight attacks um and at initiative eight you're going basically ahead of everything in the game and simultaneously with curs and fulgrim and you're going to do a heck of a lot more damage to them than they are to you likely if you're fighting them so um, why, the, why eight? Oh, eight attacks because you charge plus one. Yeah, plus one. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know what I think is probably a more impactful rule is the jump infantry um, buff. So you know when you have jump infantry, uh, for the most part, you know people use the increased movement. Um, you know, or that's what they think of when they think of jump infantry, right? Um, but the ability for jump infantry to roll, you know, the 3D, you know, their their assault, um, where that's I think 3D6 and discard the the lowest, I think, right? Um, I think it's a roll. I'll find out for you right now. Yeah. As you read uh, that rule. So normally, it's you have to pick one or the other. If you if you use the the jump pack in the movement phase, you don't get to use it in the assault phase. The ability to use it in both is huge. It's it's absolutely you know I, I can't um, you know I can't articulate how impactful that is when your entire army, especially, is jump. Um, and of course, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it for you. Okay. Um, assault phase. If you use it in the assault phase, uh, you can reroll charge distance. Um, furthermore, you gain hammer of wrath. And then you Ooh. also really move through things, right? Oh, kind of yeah. Okay, yeah. So I got it totally wrong. I was thinking um, that's, uh, yeah, that's totally off. Um, so that's, but yeah, that's, that's, that's crazy. Right? Because, because you can move over things. So you technically yeah. do like difficult terrain. So you don't have to do the minus two when you're charging. Yeah. Right? 
you're going through difficult terrain. You do have to take dangerous terrain tests, but yeah. um, being able to do that, being able to gain Hammer Wrath, and being able to reroll yours is good. Now, yeah. overall, unless you're charging through difficult terrain, normally the extra automatic six inches in the movement phase is better. That's why mm -hmm. most people use it. But being able to do both, you're absolutely correct. Like, that's unreal, because it gives you yeah. such a strike range. Like, enormous. Being able to reroll that, right, is, is huge. Yeah, it, it is. And, uh, yeah, I have to apologize, uh, you know, to you guys and the listeners. Uh, it's 10 o'clock here, and I can't believe I got that <laughs> that wrong. Out of all the out of all the rules to get wrong, like, the, the core one <laughs> for, uh, for... That's jump, all good. We all, we've, we've all done that in the past. I don't know. Where, where... Did they... What, is it beasts or what was what was the one that there was something once upon a time or it still is that lets you roll three d6 and discard the lowest? I'm not sure. Right, I'm there was something. Check. Oh, you know what it is? You know what it is? Sorry, it's the Incandius Dreadnought. It lets you roll three d6 um, for oh. when you use it. It's jump pack. You can roll three d6 to determine its charge range. Mm. That's right. Okay. Well, at least I'm not totally on. And on crack. Um, <laughs> the only thing that's weird is he doesn't get that rule. Right? That is true, yes. That's kind of weird. I, I mean, I think it happens to a lot of Primarchs, actually. A lot of Primarchs out there you give rules, but doesn't they, don't apply yeah. to them. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think Korax is one, right? So, or no. So, he, Sanguinius um, does get that, get the same benefit through other special rules uh, so okay. so he has obviously fleet um you know which it gives you the re-roll um but when you look at um we'll get to his war gear and, and I'll, I'll explain what covers it there but um then when we're looking at his other special rule angelic presence um any units within three inches of him gain plus d3 to wound value used to calculate if the unit has won a close combat um so that one it it isn't as significant. Uh, it's only basically going to be affecting his unit generally, unless you've got a lot of combats in, in close proximity. Um, and you know, basically, it's just for the most part, it'll probably just add to a modifier because generally, Sanguinius is probably going to, especially when he's backed up by you know Dawnbreakers, is probably going to win most of the combats that he's in. Um, but uh, yeah, you know it's an extra D3 wound value to calculate, so not not a bad thing, but it's not like world shattering. It's good if you if you're fighting something um, that isn't fearless, right? I think uh, a lot it's weird of because like you look at Fulgrim, he has a Fulgrim has a similar rule, but I'm pretty sure his is like um, plus one across the board. Plus one. Yeah, I think Fulgrim yeah, might be across the board, but it's uh, only plus one. Across the board, right? Yeah. yeah, but across the board seems a lot more totally. useful, right? Totally, but, but this is a... I'm reading it right now. Uh, Fulgrim himself, so Legion of Stardis, I'm pretty sure, and Fulgrim himself gained plus two to combat resolution. So, like... Better rule. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they need it more. So I, I feel like... <laughs> that's because they're, they're, they're losing like, combat, Armin. They, they need the buff. They need the buff. <laughs> I don't know, man. E either way, I feel like you're right. I feel like the rule is a little weird because if Sanguinus is in there, he's killing anything. If he's not killing anything, that means there's another Primarch in there. And in which case, it's then fearless. <laughs> fearless. Anyways, right? So I feel like it's kind of weird. I, I think they should have just made it, you know. I, I think it's a rule board. for rule's sake, to be honest. I think okay. it's. You know, Primarchs need X amount of special rules. Um, well, what do we give to Sanguinius, right? Because um, they could have easily broken up. Sorry, say that again, James? Yeah, I didn't catch that either. Maybe he, uh, he got broken off. Sire of the Blood Angels into two different rules. Hey, James, sorry, we kind of... Uh... No, he, uh, no, we just... There he is. Can you guys hear me? There he is. There You're back are. now. Yeah. Back. Back. Got, I'm back from the warp. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what, what you guys heard me say, but basically I was just saying, you know, uh, his previous rule 
was a lot, right? So it could have easily been two rules. Um, the Sire of the Blood Angels, so, you know, he's he's still got lots of love. Um, armor. Yeah, so the Regalia Resplendent, um, very standard Primarch armor, two up, four up in Vuln, um, but it allows him to reroll any failed invulnerable saves on a turn in which he charges. Um, so that's nice. Um, it's nice that it works against Overwatch um, because he would have charged that turn. Um, and yeah, it's it's rerolling invulns is never a bad thing, right? As as we know with Custode's stupid shields. I I might be able to argue that the Overwatch part um, because it says in the turn which he charges. So you could say that it could technically be like if he completes a charge, um, but I don't think anybody would. I don't know. I don't think it, I would. It, to be honest, it, I, I it would have to say if if that was the case, it would say successful charge because there is precedence for rules saying when you successfully complete a charge or if you fail a charge. Yeah. yeah. In this case too, we could say like when he declares a charge. I don't know. I don't know it's kind of yeah. weird, but either way. Or it would say like in close combat, like in the combat yeah. phase. Or I, I, I don't know. I don't. Know. I don't think. I, no. I don't think it will. When, he's char when well, he charges, man. Like. And well, and here's the thing. Okay, so does the turn? Okay, so if you're if you're top of turn, so say you're Blood Angels player, you charge top of turn two. Does it go into bottom of turn two that you get the reroll as well? Would you get it for two rounds of combat? The same turn. Uh, on a turn. They, they specify. That's a good point. Um, turn which charges. I think when they say turn, they mean player turn. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's what I. That's what I would assume, player. right? Well, yeah, I think that's specified in the rule book. Um, yeah, that, that think, a turn refers to player turn. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I'll tell you right now. I'm actually looking at it. It says whenever a rule refers to a turn, it always means player turn. Unless it specifically refers to a game turn. Okay. And it's a page yeah. two for anybody go. that's looking. Bold. So, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it would be on the turn that he charges. But, yeah, I don't think I would ever argue it. I wouldn't really argue it either. I, I think, it, I mean, you could argue it, but I wouldn't. Four plus and vulnerable, invulnerable, like, Overwatch rarely ever does anything. And really, like, if you're shooting Overwatch, you're shooting with the wrong things anyway. Because he's charging and you're going to yeah. die no matter what. <laughs> um... <laughs> And, and that's why in 8th and 9th edition they changed it from turn to battle round. <laughs> it's, it's player turn and battle round. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so overall, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's good armor. It's what I would have expected. Um, I think when you go into, you know, when you stray into a 3 plus invuln save, um, you go into very, very um, powerful territory, um, especially with Sanguinius's damage output. Um, so when we look at the Great Wings, so this is where I was saying he gets the benefits. So he may always use his jump pack, um, represented by his Great Wings, in both the movement and assault phase. And when he resolves his Hammer of Wrath tax, he does so at strength 10 AP2. Um, that is very good. Uh, an automatic strength 10 AP2 hit, uh, in particular against vehicles, where... Uh, you know, yeah, you can you can do some major damage with that, um, and even again, like you know, you you could charge into a custode squad and instant kill one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And that's so, initiative ten, right? The uh, yes, yeah, the the hammer wrath happened at initiative uh, ten. Like literally, you um, can pop a dreadnought or whatever. Right? So. And more importantly, <laughs> and more impactfully, uh, <laughs> when deploying via deep strike. Sanguinius and any unit he accompanies does not scatter. So, um, big deal when you've got a legion full of jump packs and when you've got access to so many, you know, Infernus pistols, Melta pistols, um, the ability to deep strike right behind a, you know, uh, Spartan or a Knight or you know, anything really, and unload a bunch of melta pistols into them, or melta shots, or, um, you know, assault cannons, 
right? Um, Angel's Tears don't have the limitation that they can't be joined by, um, you know, normal destroyers can't be joined by characters or whatever. Um, Angel's Tears don't have that. So you could actually have Sanguinius with Angel Tears, with, you know, um, the Assault Cannons with Suspenser Webs, which make it range 12, Deep Strike into something. And what's even kind of more wonky and an even cooler combo is Blood Angel, or sorry, Moratats, um, or the Angel's Tears specifically say that Moratats can join them. So you could actually have Sanguinius and a Moratat in a unit Deep Strike down. Um, so you could get some very nasty Melta chain fires off guaranteed with a Moratat. Yep. So yeah, it's good. <laughs> no, it's really nice. And, and I mean, I wouldn't expect anything different. Like, no, he's yeah. got a he's Why got a lot of uh, army boosting abilities, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, and and again, you know, you see a lot of a lot of 30k um, rules are taken inspiration wise from their 40k you know counterparts and you know back i'm not sure if dante still well no he doesn't still do it but back in the day when when 40k was you know fifth sixth and seventh edition um dante did the same thing where the unit he joined didn't scatter uh, which was significant then too so i think it only makes sense that you know if dante could do it sanguinius could do it Sure. Um, sky Strike? Yeah, Sky Strike. So that's, uh, again, a pretty cool rule. Um, it kind of is like the, uh, you know, the, like you said, the flyby slashing something. Um, vector Strike. So basically, almost. yeah, Vector Strike. Um, so it's very, you know, cinematic. But whenever he uses his jump pack rule, you may nominate one enemy unit not locked in combat that he has moved, you know, over that turn. That unit takes one hit. Um, if the unit is an enemy flyer in zoom or an enemy swooping monstrous creature, it takes D3 hits. These were resolved to strike 6 AP2 um, using random allocation and ignore cover special rule. Against vehicles, these hits are resolved against the side armor. So um, just a really nice perk, right? You fly over, get to do a strike 6 AP2 hit. Um, it's it's quite, you know, quite a, quite a bit better. Um, against things like lightnings, which you'll see in a lot of competitive metas, um, you know this could really do some work, if not outright kill a lightning that you move over, um, or any of the flyers, whether it's a siphon or or anything like that. It's also a great thing um, against uh, against demons, right? You know, there's a lot of flying monstrous creature demons, so this is just a nice way to get some extra wounds on them, and uh, you know. It, enemy vehicles can't jink it because it ignores cover so it's uh the only downside i think the only thing that if, if you actually pay attention uh like if we have a look at it a lightning siphon like if you're actually paying attention to the game they're not going to be within 12 inches of him generally so not right? that no. said though demons might and so um if you have a flying monster creature demon and you jink you go fly over him and you hit him you will force to a grounding test if you do wound, right? And if he grounds, you can charge him then, right? Uh, you well, yes, yeah, because you're not in right. zoom mode technically. So, yeah, because right. normally, so, yeah, yeah. So you, I you, mean, like, I, I think against vehicles, uh, vehicles, yes, I think against flying vehicles, you're gonna have rarely ever be able to do this because most people won't put their vulnerable vehicle close by, but. I think against demons, especially guys that run lots of flying monster creature demons, which is basically almost any demon player, um, I think you will have the opportunity to do that. And that's kind of neat, because you get those free hits, right? And then if you ground him, you charge him. And if you don't, he can't charge you next turn anyways, because he's flying, right? So it's kind of like a bonus either way, right? Yeah. No, so. for sure. I, I think, uh, yeah, again, it's, it, it's, it's it's cinematic. It's, it's probably not going to, you know... Um, win you a lot of games but it might it might get you that edge up or it might get you that last you know that last model or um you know if you've got some guy with uh you know a, a sergeant running around with artificer armor with one you know the lone sergeant or something like that there, there's lots of cinematic stuff you can do with it still yeah and, and like um, using that like in that instance like you said with like the lone you know last marine out of the squad that's a nice ability because you could 
it technically take that out, and it, it could be one of those uh, missions. Kill points, where, yeah. Kill points, right? Yeah. So. Or yeah, or killing. You know, how many how many games have we all had where there's only one model still claiming exactly. an objective? You know, hiding behind the corner or something. Um, so yeah, again, it's it's cool. It makes sense. It's fluffy. Um, you know, if Korax can swing, can fly by and do stuff, then Sanguinius sure as hell should oh, be able to. Um, the last bit is Infernus, so uh, you know, an 18-inch range, strength 8, AP 1, uh, assault 2, one-use weapon. Um, so, you know, it's not the best Primarch shooting weapon out there, but it's definitely not... I'd say the, the worst. It's not an Arco Archaeotech pistol, um, <laughs> so I can't complain. Um, the fluff behind it is that it's so, you know, ancient and int intricate. It's, it's, it is Archaeotech, but it's um, a heat beam emitter, so basically the little fine components get fried every time it's used. So, um, again, you know, it's it's not melta type, which I think a lot of people would automatically assume that it, it would be given its name. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still two strength eight AP one shots. So in conjunction with his ability to land anywhere, you can definitely take some good pot shots into the rear of a vehicle. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. Um, now I think it's the you know one of the most interesting debates. Um, and one of the most interesting things about Sanguinius is um, the blade in Carmine. Um, so one thing that I really want to point out that a lot of people don't realize because in list building programs you select the armament, the rules as written, you do not need to select what weapon Sanguinius has in your army list it's before the game begins. So you absolutely can see what is facing you across the table and say, I'm gonna use the Blade in Carmine today or I'm gonna use the Spear of Telesto. Yeah. So, so you have to um, make sure that you have both models. Or yes. Really to switch between the two and I think that's where most people might get hung up on, but yeah. I think as long as you pay attention to that and magnetize it or, or you know, do what you need to do, I think that will kind of, you'll never have an issue with that. Yeah. He's so, he's the, got like three weapons, doesn't he? he? He does, but the Spear of Telesto goes with the Moon Silver Blade. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, we'll, we'll cover the Blade and Carmine first, because it's the simplest. For sure. um, it's plus one strength, AP2, melee, rampage, and shred. Um, so, that puts him at strength seven, um, you know, re-rolling wounds and rampage. So if he's by himself, he gets an extra D3 attack. So again, this could easily have Sanguinius capping out at, at, at 10 attacks on a turn that he charges, especially with Sire of the Blood Angels. Um, so before we compare them, I'll go over the Spear of Telesto. <clears throat> so the Spear of Telesto can be used in melee, and it's a one-use only thrown weapon. So in melee, its strength is user and it's AP2 normally. But on a turn that you charge, it's plus three strength and AP1. So when you're charging with this guy, he's strength nine, AP1, um, which is, is huge, right? You know, um, and if that wasn't enough, the weapon is instant death, mastercrafted, and has a rule called Wrath of Angels, which is for every successful wound roll of a six, that you know unit suffers an additional wound using the same profile so it is a very very scary weapon and one of my favorite primarch weapons to be completely honest um and then once per game in the shooting phase uh in lieu of you know shooting in furnace you can whip the spear so it's 12 inch range strength 7 ap1 assault 1 instant death armor bane and has wrath of angels and if he whips the spear, you can no longer use it in combat. It is not like Thor's hammer, unfortunately. Um, and you would pull out Moon Silver Blade, which is a strength as user AP3, Mastercrafted, Blind, Duelist's Edge, which is plus one initiative um, in a duel, Moon and Silver. Moon Silver, which 
any wound caused against a model with Demon or Demon of the Runestorm or Psyker is instead counted as two wounds, um, and they do not spill over. So a lot of information, um, a lot of, I think, um, things to compare. Um, what do you guys think, just from kind of the, the quick overview, what's your preference? Personally, I think overall, I really like the Blade and the Carmine, right? Interesting, Plus okay, interesting. A tread, like it just, you know, seven strength base, always mm -hmm. shredding is, is great. Uh, the only downside I see, and, and I mean, I, I look at it in terms of armies, right? How often is your Primarch wrecking a vehicle? Let's say almost never, except if you're fighting Knight and maybe a Dreadnought or two, right? So I think overall, I think the Blade is good. Um, yeah, I, I like the Blade. I, I mean, again, if you're, if you're fighting Primarchs, you probably want the Blade. Right? Yeah, the, the blade is yeah absolutely like, the blade is better against primers. That's right. If you're fighting anything else, well, the spear is more versatile, right? I mean, strength as user might not be as good as plus one strength shred, but if you're killing marines, you don't really care, right? Or terminators or whatever. Um, but then against vehicles, the the plus three strength, you know, yeah, is, is amazing. Um, Against uh, like Mechanicum, it's they, huge. death is amazing. Instant death against right? Mechanicum and Demons and Custodes is is yeah. astronomical. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like personally, again, I would wait to see. Like I would walk up to the to the game and look, and you know, if I'm fighting Custodes, probably the Spear, right? If I'm fighting Mechanicum, probably the Spear. If I'm fighting Knights, the Spear. If I'm fighting, if I'm going to be going up against Russ in combat or against yep. uh, Horus. Horus or something, <laughs> I'd probably go with the Blade because there's yeah. other things in the army that are going to handle the rest. I need him to handle that part, primer, right? So that's probably what I do. I think model-wise, I think the Spear is awesome. Yeah, I mean, the, spear is, the Spear looks beautiful. But I think the Spear looks amazing. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think I would definitely make a point of uh, somehow carefully either pinning or magnetizing or um, what, what did you do James? What I magnetized it. It's, it's actually a really really easy one to magnetize. Um, you basically just drill down into the wrist a little bit, place you know a small magnet, um, you know that both hands have kind of like an extending piece where they would normally go down into the wrist. You just chop that off and replace it with a magnet and um, it's very light of course because it's resin it's a hand and a spear um, so it's super easy peasy um, that was what i did what i did for my first sanguineous i i confess for my for my uh second sanguineous i've done i i did glue the spear because you know uh, just for cinematic you know my blood angels aren't, aren't meant to be a super competitive army so i like the you know this the cinematic you know look with the uh the spear what about you, Andy? Do you, do you agree with uh, Armin's kind of verdict? Well, I think Armin kind of nailed it there, but yeah, uh, like they're yeah, they're both really good, right? They they um, are. They absolutely are. I, I I mean I like the spear myself. Mm -hmm. um, just I don't know. Well, model wise, obviously, like you guys just mentioned, but uh, you know, instant death, master crafted, um, and then like wrath of angels. Every successful wound that you roll six, it's an additional wound. So I mean, I mean, shred is is probably better. Well, it is better than that, but uh, just having the, the spear itself on the model to me is like <laughs> just I'll take that, you know. Yeah, uh, and and that's the other thing. Rampage on the sword is good too, you know, especially if you're sure. making sure that you're going into a combat where you're outnumbered. Um, I, so I agree with everything that uh, that you guys said. I am more partial to the spear uh, just because I like the versatility of it. Um, and most of you know I, I most of the opponents that I play, you know especially in, um, you know locally, uh, generally are 
are pretty vicious armies, Mechanicum, Demons, Custodes. Um, so I think the Spear is a lot better for that. And it's also um, having the anti-armor ability. So again, I, my Blood Angels are a fairly fluffy army. I don't have a lot of anti-vehicle um, in it other than, you know, my Moritath and some, you know, Assault Cannons with Angel's Tears. So having that, you know, Strength 9, um, you know, you can actually hurt a knight, right? Um, I think when you look at the blade, um, absolutely better against Primarchs, better against than better against like you know the the Eternal Warrior demons, um, you know like uh, I think Tabanda is Eternal Warrior, um, and I know the the Demon Lord is. So yeah, overall both are great weapons though. Um, in regards to other Primarchs, I don't think the sword is enough to make Sanguinius be able to beat Russ. Um, and and kind of when we're talking about Sanguinius, um, I guess we'll, we'll finish. I'll finish ta talking about the weapons. So, in terms of the spear, I would never throw it. Uh, it's just not worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah agree with that like for it's, sure. it's it's a la yeah it's a it's a last turn. You're not going to get in combat kind of throw. Um, in terms of Moon Silver Blade, um, well, you know, if it was AP two, maybe there would be an argument for it, but I would rather instant death demons and Sekhmet Terminators with the spear than do two wounds to then do double the wounds that don't spill over, right? So, yep. you know, again, it's cool. Like, the, I, I get the imagery of it. Um, and I guess you can't give a guy, you know, three amazing, awesome weapons. That would be a little bit too much. So, um, but yeah, when, when you're looking at Sanguinius, I, I, th I think he's a very good Primarch. I think he's one of the better Primarchs. Um, I think I think his army buffs are significant in combat. Um, I think he's one of the best combat Primarchs, not just from a Primarch on Primarch perspective, but from a Primarch versatility perspective, right? Like, he can kill pretty much everything. Um, he can kill monsters, he can kill units, he can kill vehicles, he's fast. Um, you know, if, if I was to say that there's the only... Oh, James. Cut out again. Cut out again. Yeah. I would, I'm going to continue his thought. I would say the only Primark that I think does things better than him is probably Horus, to be honest. He's not as fast, but he's got amazing army buffs. He can also deal with almost any Primark, almost any unit, uh, and almost any vehicle, right? Yeah. Um, and has more survivability, right? Yeah, Horus is definitely better. Oh, hmm. is that what you were going to say? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Basically, Horus is, <laughs> in terms of versatility and army buffs, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think what Sanguinius needs, what he needed, if I could change a rule, would be give him weapon skill 10. Um, I, in the fluff, it's reflected that he is the best in combat. He is the greatest, you know, um, mm. duelist or, or, you know, uh, fighter. Um, you know, Horus even says, hey, like, I'm afraid of him. That's why he, you know, wanted Angron. It's because Angron is the only Primarch that... Horus thought could beat Sanguinius or, or stand a chance against him in combat. Yeah. Um, and from a rules perspective, changing him to weapon skill 10 would change pretty much absolutely nothing except how he fares against Russ, Angron, and Kabanda. So, you know, when you're looking at Primarch on Primarch, um, Sanguinius will generally lose to Horus generally lose to Russ, and part of the reason that is is because the minus to hit. Um, you know, both being weapon skill 9, needing a 4, and then with Russ's minus 1, needing a 5, it, it's absolutely crippling, whereas if he was weapon skill 10, hitting on 4s wouldn't be so bad. Um, Angron gets around Russ's thing with, with hatred. Um, so, I... I I do think that that's one thing I would tweak, but he's still in the top four best combat primarchs, I think. Well, we're forgetting the lion. 
Yeah, yeah the line. Well, well, we need to see. We'll no, we don't to want to see. talk about him. <laughs> so, but, but what I'm saying is like his rule fixes that, right? Like irrelevant of weapon skill, he never hits on Horus and the plus. Yeah, right? but but only Russ. And, and, o- on, that only matters against Russ and Horus because Horus okay. is claws. Oh, three plus, four plus. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So. so but you're yeah, right, so it's the same here though, right? If he was 10, it would only apply against like two Primarchs. And it's the same thing with Lion. The Lion's rule only usually applies to, to what, two units Primarchs. in the game. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I, said, I think they could Sanguinius really well. I think, you know, like I said, um, you know, it's very seldom that I sit down and look at any one particular unit and say, it's perfect, it's exactly how I envisioned it. Um, I think Sanguinius came pretty close. Like I said, the only thing I would do is make him weapon skill 10. Um, I, I think also, you know, the one thing that kind of irks me is um, in the story, he destroys Kabanda the second time they fight. Um, and Kabanda is just, like, if you put Kabanda up to, against Sanguinius, Kabanda has hatred Sanguinius, but Sanguinius doesn't have hatred Kabanda. And it makes it really kind of uneven. So I probably also give Sanguinius hatred for Kabanda, um, because otherwise, you know, he can get mulched by him. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a kind of weird thing, right? Like they just gave such a specialized fluffy rule to Kabanda, but not to Sanguinius. It's really, really weird. Yeah, it's it, almost it's, like it's almost like if they did, they should have put it in Kabanda's rule that says, you know. Uh, Kabanda has hatred sanguineness, and in games where you're facing sanguineness, sanguineness also gets hatred Kabanda. Totally, right? right? It, it's um, kind of it's kind of super weird, right? Like that doesn't make sense. Honestly, if I was ever playing demons and I was going had Kabanda and I was going up against sanguineness, I'd be like, "You got hatred against me because it doesn't make sense that you don't." Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, and I think I think one of those, maybe maybe it's one of those things where like. Kambanda hates him because he got destroyed, so he hates him more. But it makes it difficult for Sanguinius to go up against him. Right? Yeah, San- Sanguinius won't generally win against him. And again, it, Kabanda beat Sanguinius the first time. So it, it, if anything, it should be the other way around. Sanguinius should hate him. <laughs> I thought Sanguinius beat him, though. He, Sanguinius beats him on Terra. But he loses to him at, yeah. on the on the Yeah, the he gets, he gets, he gets knocked unconscious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kabanda, and that's what psychically scars the Blood Angels, is like, yeah, Kabanda, like, you know, like, knocks them out type thing. And uh, and then when they, you know, and then when Sanguinius wakes up, he sees all of his sons dead, and he's like, raw rage. Uh, and that's why when they fight again at the Siege of Terra, Sanguinius absolutely destroys him. And he and, doesn't beat him? No. So he wakes up? No, he's gone. Kabanda's huh. gone. Huh. I don't. I yeah. thought. That's interesting. I don't remember that. I'm gonna have to reread that book now. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, so yes, and I think you know the only other thing that I, I think people maybe would have expected, especially since they set a precedent, is uh, Sebatar's rule, right? Where he's kind of got that. He's got. He's a level one psyker with precog, um, but only can cast it on, you know, two warp charges. I think um, I think some people would have expected that Sanguinius would have had something similar where he's a level one Psyker. Um, but I think that probably the reason they didn't do that is more of a game mechanic purpose. You know, we, we all know and love Magnus in the game, um, and we know how it goes when you give a Primarch psychic powers um and so i think you know if you imagine because again the one that would make sense would be for sanguinius to have prescience or precognition and if he had either of those powers he would be an order of magnitude more powerful than he already is oh for but it's sure. the same with curs right because curs have psychic powers either right yeah no Cur- curs didn't um and but curs is again right like especially like he, he had a lot of like haunting haunting visions but a lot of it you know I, I, I don't know at least in in the books it seemed like sanguinius had a little bit more clear visions and you know he was yeah yeah 
but but definitely well and again right like if Savitar has it but again i understand why they didn't for curves and sanguinius because it it, it just it, it makes balancing them a lot harder yeah no agreed agreed Not and sure. really uh, you can build that into the rules right there's yeah. no reason why you can't build um something like that in, in into the rules right which i think yeah. they kind of try to do with curves right so and and I think you know there's still room for you know um, like when they do the demon primarchs if they do demon primarchs um, you know there's nothing there's nothing saying that they might not um, you know when they do a, a demon empowered Horus have you know uh, a little side note where Sanguinius can have you know for you know precognition or forbearance or whatever you know there's nothing to say that they couldn't change or alter the rules right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, agreed. But yeah, I think I think you know, I think Sanguinius epitomizes his legion. I think, in terms of how he ranks amongst the Space Marine Primarchs, I think, um, you know, he he ranks fairly strongly um, in terms of combat versatility and army buffs. I I would definitely put him probably in my top five. Primarchs um, for game power wise and, or influence on the game, um, and just like I would put the Blood Angels uh, in the top five legions, um, I think Blood Angels have the access to the rights of war that lets them play competitively in a very different style from other Marines. Um, I think that they really hit the nail on the head with this legion and. Um, it's a very fun and different legion to play. Um, so, you know, for, for those who kind of stuck with us through both parts of this, you know, hopefully uh, it's inspired you to, to pick up this legion because it is a very rewarding one from a hobby perspective, a game perspective, and a strategy perspective. It's, it's, it's just an awesome experience. So. No, and that's, and that's well said. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you guys for having me on to talk about it, because you know, yeah, like <laughs> they, they're they, they've been they've been close to my heart for a very long time, and you know, uh, when it comes to 30k, uh, you know, I I I played hundreds of games with my custodes and my world leaders. I played some with my blood angels, um, you know, back when they first were released. But I'm looking forward to playing a lot more, um, you know, with them. Uh, in the tournaments, in the in the, tur the grand tournaments, in the next year or two. So, uh, yeah, I, yes. I look forward to playing you guys with them. Oh, for sure. Well, as soon as, as, soon as they're done, James knows that he's <laughs> he's going to the channel and he's going to be give you a couple of that <laughs> with his army. That's for sure. So. Definitely, right on. No, that's awesome. It was a good uh, good overview. Um, yeah, thanks, James, for joining us again. Yeah, no, thank you for so, having me. For sure, anytime, anytime. So yeah, if you guys. Uh, you guys enjoy these last two <laughs> podcasts of the Blood Angels. You know, download some more, like, share, subscribe, check out our YouTube, you know, our Instagram, Facebook page. Um, so yeah, thanks guys for joining in. Thanks for being here, and we will catch you guys later. <laughs>